All right. No, so Felix just. So, welcome everyone. Felix, I was just going to start, and then you said something funny, and everybody laughed. It was very nice. Um, so it's a pleasure to welcome Professor Adam Sobel uh, to JPL. I explained to him again that Friday is not a typical day where you know JPL is full, uh, but there will be plenty of people on WebEx, so we won't be disappointed that it's only like 15 or 20 of us. I met Adam the first time, I think it was over 20 years ago, in a winter school that Bjorn, Steve, well, he wasn't organizing. I think Dave Nealon, Carrie Manuel, and Andy Maida were organizing it. This is like 2002. And at the time, Bjorn told me, you know, keep an eye on him. He's one of the best in the business by far. So I'll just share that. But that was incredibly over 20 years ago. Uh, Adam is a very successful uh, researcher and educator. He's a professor at. Uh, at Columbia University, both engineering school and, and the Lamont Hort Dorothy uh, Earth Observatory. He's a fellow of the AGU, fellow of the AMS, over 200 peer reviewed publications. A book, right? Storm Search. Um, and recently, a podcast called Deep Convection. He's a, a, a remarkable and very successful scientist. He started in the stratosphere, but as he just mentioned to me, even before his PhD was over, he was already down at the troposphere, and he, he made his name on um, a lot of important research on tropical uh, atmospheric dynamics, which I guess took him to extreme weather, to hurricanes, and naturally as well towards climate risk science. And today he's going to tell us, I guess, everything we need to know about climate risk science. So please take it away. Thank you again, Adam. Thanks, Joao. Uh, definitely not everything you need to know, but. Uh, I guess it depends on how on your needs, but uh, right. Um, so this is the direction my work has been going in the last 10 years or so, and I'm going to try to mention the contributions of the other people as we go, um, rather than put a lot of names on the screens. So anyway, thanks for having me here. It's an honor to be at JPL. I've never been on this campus before, so it's uh, it's great to see uh, learn about all the amazing science that's happening here. Okay, so what are we talking about? This is my uh, is this my question? Okay, people online and stuff. Okay, uh, so the question I'm starting with here uh, is how can physical climate science, that's what I was trained to do, like I guess probably most or all of you, how can it support climate action? And this is not a question I asked myself when I was young, but it's a question I've been asking myself lately, and I think a lot of our younger scientists especially are asking themselves. And here I'm going to talk about what we, the name I've been using is climate risk science. I don't actually love the name, but I haven't come up with a better one. And what we're really talking about here is science that makes climate impacts concrete and quantitative to inform decision making. Usable science is another name you could say. Um, in practice, it's a layer between the climate modeling or basic climate science and application, people who are actually going to use it. So that layer involves downscaling, bias correction, uh, 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 downscaling, especially around extreme events, impact modeling to some degree, which is obviously a huge field or many fields. Uh, but if you're thinking about climate adaptation, which is, uh, to get to the last bullet, I, I think the most, the biggest sort of use of the kind of science I'm talking about, although it's relevant to mitigation too through the social cost of carbon. But uncertainty quantification, decision support, all the stuff you need to take the science and inform decisions. Um, so that's, it's a layer between basic climate science and the user. And risk, the word risk, because it has to be probabilistic and we have to worry about extreme events, uh, like even individual extreme weather events or maybe extreme climate scenarios like some big tipping point or something. Um, and so we, we have to talk in terms of probabilities and try to make those probabilities quantitative. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna start with the insurance industry because our, how we, I got into this field is by working with people in the insurance industry, and now we're trying to go in the direction of not just working with the insurance industry. I think there's a lot broader use of this kind of science, but the insurance industry is very where they've been doing it for a long time, and it's a very well-informed and, and uh, educated user base. So I think it's and also a very important one societally uh, as a sort of um, mediator of climate adaptation. So I think it's important to think about. So just to talk about insurance for a minute. 
Um, the insurance industry, which has modeled disaster risk for a long time to know how to price their products, but they're only now, I would say in the last few years, seriously starting to reckon with climate change, and that includes both putting it in the models they use to price risk, but also thinking about whether they're going to stay in some markets. You've probably seen these headlines. Um, this is ones that came out after Hurricane Ian last year in Florida, um, but there have been more, and you know that, that's, that the big insurers are starting to get out of some of the uh, highest risk markets, including Florida for hurricane, of course, California for wildfire risk. So that's one thing that's happening, um, just to, sh to show that this is, you know, this is big stuff, because if you can't get insurance, you can't get a mortgage, and if you can't get a mortgage, most people, I mean, that's gonna change, that's gonna cause big economic crises um, in, in these parts of the world. So it's very consequential. Um, then the other thing that's happening in the private sector, and the private sector is important, I, I really wanna focus, in a way, not on the private sector, but I think it's important to understand what's happening in the private sector because it's been tremendous change in the last few years. Um, so there's now, the, the insurance industry had their own sort of cottage industry that did climate risk modeling, they called catastrophe modeling, but now there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's not for insurance. So these are the names of companies that most of them I have either former students or postdocs or senior colleagues sometimes working at these companies. Uh, full disclosure, I'm an external advisor to Jupiter. I don't do much, but I have an affiliation with them. And um, so these are, some of these are startups, some of these are uh, big financials and insurance companies that you've probably heard of, but that have acquired startups or started their own little climate risk groups. Um, and uh, this is, the big market I think is, is risk disclosure. The, the, the SEC has proposed a rule, they have some already in, the, in the Europe and I, now in California as I understand, that companies have to disclose their climate risk. So nobody knows what their climate risk is really. Uh, and so these companies will tell you for a price. And there's transition risk and physical risk. Transition is around carbon. Physical risk is actual risk to your buildings or assets or supply chains or whatever from, from extreme weather events or other climate impacts. So that's my field. So we're not going to talk really about carbon here. Ooh, I have to watch my hands and not hit that mic. Okay, so that's a thing that's happening. And so the kind of science I'm talking about today is the kind of science that these companies to some extent are doing. And I think they're actually ahead of us. And by us, I mean academia and government. Um, and there's growing demand for this kind of stuff in the, huma in the sort of nonprofit NGO space. So we're working with the World Bank pretty closely, have been trying to work with some humanitarian organizations, including the Red Cross, the START Network, that hasn't gotten as far. Um, but for climate adaptation, disaster risk reduction, and humanitarian assistance, they need some of the same kind of stuff. Okay, so what is that stuff? And oh, the US government. So this is new under the Biden administration. This is a very exciting change, and I think is in some ways maybe why I'm here. Uh, to talk to you, but um, this has just happened in the last, very recently. So this is a report that came out, maybe some of you might have been involved in it. I was not, but I'm huge, uh, hugely excited when it came out. This is uh, the so-called PCAST report, President's Council of Advisors in Science and Technology. So that's a, uh, gov a group commissioned by the, to advise the president. Um, and it, it basically says that we need a kind of public option of the private sector stuff. So what it means is, probabilities of extreme weather events of given types and their impacts. So they talk about, I, this is my bold added to it, but these are just some quotes from the report. We need high resolution modeling and state of the art statistical methods to quantify annual extreme weather ris risks now and going forward at high resolution. And then risk assessment modeling systems that, that use extreme weather probabilities, weather hazard models and hazard loss. So loss is going from hazard to impact, we'll, we'll do definitions in a couple slides. But this is um, saying this, that we need this stuff and we don't have it yet. And the agencies, should, the federal agencies should do it. Um, uh, this was another one, this came out a year or two ago. This was a National Academy report informing the US Global Change Research product. And it says some similar things that we need to, it's sort of moving the science in a more applied direction. It talks about avoiding the consequences of urgent risks and to human and natural systems and managing climate change risk. It's not language around just understanding the system, which is what I was kind of trained to do. It's language around action, right? Um, so it says this is a more interdisciplinary and applied problem and the agencies should do it. That says the same kind of thing. This is another one. This came out in March. Um, the Council of Economic Advisors. This was chapter nine for those paying attention at home. It was written by Fran Moore, a great young climate economist from UC Davis who was um, uh, delegated to the the White House for a year, and it says some of the same thing. It basically says the government is holding a huge amount of climate risk and needs to be informed about it to know how to take action, and so we need this kind of decision-relevant uh, uh, um, 
climate information for adaptation planning, and it's largely missing more fine-tuned tools are dis on specific risks in particular places for adaptation. This is, and we need, and it's a public good, so we can't rely on the private sector to do it. Not because the private sector is bad, not because they're greedy, not because they're, but because they don't have the, because the government, um, this is, uh, this is why, because, so this is a, a, a document I got in an NSF email a couple months ago, but it basically says that the government should have open science. If the government is making consequential decisions for the public, it should be based on open science that's traceable. And that's what the private sector can't do, because intellectual property is how they make their money. They can't make it open or they'd be out of business. So it should be transparent, you know, peer review, all that stuff that you guys know about and do. Um, okay, so that's framing the overall problem. So what are we talking about? Okay, with all that introduction, what is risk? So risk is talked about generally, I think in, in, in certainly in the insurance business, but in many other spaces as well, as a product of three things, uh, exposure, hazard, and vulnerability. So hazard is the one I was trained to know something about, and probably most of you too. Hazard is the geophysical thing, right? The hurricane or the earthquake or the flood or whatever is the thing that comes from the planet itself. Um, exposure is whatever the stuff is that we're worried about being damaged or lost. So in insurance, it's property and casualties, buildings usually, but could be anything, could be ecosystem, could be human health of a human population, anything, as long as you can put a number on it somehow, that's your exposure and it's usually distributed in space. Uh, and vulnerability is the connection between the two. Vulnerability tells you for a given hazard, you know, if the wind speed gets this much, What's the probability that the roof blows off and the house is, you know, totaled, or you know, what fraction of the damage it's, it it will of, of the value will be lost for a given hazard? So this is um, this is a framework. So you can define that for a single event, and then if you want to do risk, you have many events and you do statistics. And this is a framework that exists in many contexts, but a theme I'm going to come back to is that people do kind of similar things, but in different ways across a wide range of um, activities. So the scales at which these things are represented, either in observations or in models, the kinds of data used, the way they're used um, are very variable uh, in different contexts. And I don't think the consequences of that are systematically understood. I guess what I'm saying is that we need a, a more organized science of, of climate risk, and we don't quite have it yet, even though there are a lot of people doing a lot of things. Um, okay, so let's talk about, I'm going to talk now about hazard for a while, because that's my actual field, and I want to say a little bit about our group's research to kind of support some of these points, even though this is a kind of a high-level meta talk, but I'm going to show a few slides. So our work is more about hazards, because we're meteorologists and um, by training, and so let's talk about how we can represent the hazard from extreme events. Not all climate risk science has to be about extreme events, but a lot of it is, because that's the leading edge of, you know, that's what causes a lot of damage. That's what a lot of uh, concern is about. So, was there a question? Oh, okay. Um, so the, uh, you want to know what the hazard is, you know, what's the probability of a hurricane, you know, category three hurricane hitting New York, right? You can go to the historical record, and the great thing about that is real data, right? Um, you're not using somebody's model. The cons are the record's generally too short to ca capture the, all the things that can happen. So a Category 3 hurricane has never hit New York City in, uh, in, since we have modern data. But we know it's not impossible. We just probably haven't waited long enough to see it. So that's one problem. And also, now history doesn't necessarily represent the future or even the present because of climate change. So that's the problem with historical record. Um, and, and the shortness of the record, so the shortness of the record is really important because when it comes to extreme events, the distribution is damage is very fat-tailed, meaning a lot of the damage comes from a few big events. But those events, by definition, are rare, and so if you have a short record, you have a problem. So you want to know what's the thousand-year storm, but if you have 50 years of data, you don't know. Um, so you can use climate models. We love climate models where I come from. Um, they're physics-based. They represent climate change organically, meaning you put in the CO2 and, you know, it gets warmer and everything happens, you know, the jet moves and whatever. The cons are they're not good at a lot of kinds of extreme events at the typical resolutions. Um, they don't, you know, they don't have great hurricanes and so on. They're expensive and complicated to use. They have systematic errors, meaning biases. And um, even though, you know, I th think on some level they're amazingly good compared to... Uh, a lot of other kinds of models that people use, but they still are biased and enough to be a problem. 
and they don't represent human impacts at all. They're not impacts models, right? You need to do that uh, offline. So in catastrophe models is, is a kind of uh, model that um, I want to talk about a little bit now. These are models that are not that familiar to many in our field. They're, they're interesting because they were really developed mostly in the private sector. I mean, some of it was done at academic groups, but then those people went. It's an insurance industry developed its own type of modeling to do what it needed. And um, so it's the same thing. They have, you have modules that, that do hazard, exposure, vulnerability, and then loss. And um, there's data for all these components, but they're highly empirical. So the hazard is generally based closely on historical data. They don't only use historical data because the purpose of the CAP models, to some extent, is to go be solve the data, the record being too short problem. So they generate synthetic events that didn't really happen, but look like the ones that did. And what that means look like is hides a lot of you know, art and science. But it, somehow you take the historical record and kind of bootstrap from it with empirical algorithms. Mostly not physical modeling to generate the synthetic events, although there might be some physical modeling to generate the details of each event, like you know, what the wind field actually looks like in a synthetic hurricane. People might use WARF for that or something. Um, so that's one problem. Um, so, but that, that is a problem when you want to do climate change. Because if you're basing it on the past, then going to the future, if you don't have enough physics, you, know, you, can't, you can't represent climate change, except in some very unsatisfying ways. Um, the, the strength of these models is that they have the best data you can probably get on exposure and vulnerability, but it's mostly proprietary. These are companies in the private sector that are getting data from their clients, which they can't share. And so I can't get it, and you probably can't get it. Even, in fact, the federal, um, a lot of flood insurance in the US is, is federal, is public, and even their claims data you can't get due to privacy issues and stuff right now. So that's one, that's one another, um, that's a problem for the public uses. And uh, also, I should say that they're calibrated closely to claims data, which is the loss that's predicted, and that data you can't get either, and neither can I. Um, right, so what we're doing in our group to say a little bit about it now, we're trying to do what you could call climate conditioning cap modeling. That's what they one set of words they use in the insurance industry, or we sometimes call, say, statistical dynamical downscaling. Um, that's words I got from Kerry Manuel, from whom I learned about this whole area of activity when he started doing it some years ago, and our work was inspired very much by his. So what we're doing differently than the industry models is our stuff's all open source and peer reviewed. We have a little more physics in order to handle climate change, although we're still doing it's still mostly statistical modeling, but has more physical information in it so we can try to downscale climate models and do climate change in a plausible way. Um, and we take a global approach. So another thing I should have said about the industry cap models is they tend to be either region specific or country specific. So they have a mo so their models for US hurricane are pretty good. The models for Mozambique and Bangladesh are pretty crummy because there's not a lot of insurance market there. Um, but our models, uh, we do stuff globally because we want to ha have, you know, we're not thinking of just the insurance that you want to use for other things. Um, okay, so how our model works, I only have one slide on it. Um, again, if you've seen Kerry Emanuel's downscaling work, its functionality is similar, just how it works is different. Um, if you haven't seen it, I'll just give you the basics of what we're doing. So, um, and this is my uh, young colleague, Jai Ying Lee, who built this model with some help from Susanna Camargo and Michael Tippett and me. Um, and the cute acronym for it is CHAZ, which stands for Columbia University Hazard Model or Tropical Cyclone Hazard Model. So the basic idea is you have a climate model that you guys know about. You take emission scenarios and you run it and generate some you know, realization of the climate, either of the past or present or future. And then what we do is we have a model that, I'm not gonna show you the equations, but it has, um, it generates synthetic storms that in some way are consistent with that climate. And so it's not solving the equations of motion. Uh, it's solving a set of equations that are predictive that we have modules for genesis of a storm, uh, track and intensity, and those are based, the, there are statistical models that relate the behavior of a storm in six hour or 12 hour time steps to the environmental conditions that the storm is in by a regression process using past storms and their environments. Environments means in space and time, the monthly local data where they happen. So it's, so it's like, it, it's a sort of statistical modeling that's loosely like what's done in insurance cap modeling, but it's informed by climate information. So you have to tell our model the climate it's in in order for it to generate storms. That's the difference. It's not just bootstrapping off the historical data directly. And so 
if, there's, if we want to do climate change, we put in more CO2 to the climate models, which we don't do ourselves. We get that from the modeling groups of the world through CMIP or whatever. And then we assume that the rules relating hurricanes to climate don't change in the future, but the climate itself does. So that's a plausible way of doing it. And because it's mostly a statistical model, it's super cheap and we can generate huge amounts of synthetic storms, which is what you want to do to do risk because you need those rare events that you, the history isn't long enough to get. Okay, um, here's one result I want to show because I think it captures a theme I'm going to be coming back to, which is epistemic uncertainty or deep uncertainty is another word for the same thing. So this is a result from a paper we published a couple years ago. And what it's showing is we, this was downscaling CMIP 5. So we, we take results from the CMIP models. This was about half a dozen of them. We've done it now for CMIP 6.2. And we put, as I just described, we generate our own cyclones. And this is the number of tropical cyclones, meaning reaching at least tropical storm intensity per year as a function of time going into the future. This was RCP 8.5 scenario for the future. The historical observations are in the black. So there's 90-ish you know, storms per year on the planet. And our model gives the right number because it is trained to. I mean, that's not a, that, you know, it was built, designed to do that. But then going into the future, the different color shadings of the different models, and you can see that there's two branches to the solution. One goes up and one goes down. And um, that's not the different climate models. Both branches are downscaling the same set of climate models. What it is is there's two versions of our model. So it, I told you that we need information about the large-scale climate. And so there's a bunch of predictors that the model uses to predict genesis and intensity. And one of those is a humidity variable. And the difference between the two versions of our model is whether you use relative humidity throughout the column or saturation deficit. So relative humidity is the ratio of the actual water vapor to the saturation value, and saturation deficit is the difference of those two numbers. And if you make maps of those two quantities in today's climate and you choose your color scales right, you cannot tell the difference. And that's why they give the same result in the past. But as the climate warms, they behave totally differently because relative humidity stays relatively constant. And in that case, it doesn't really change the number of cyclones, but other variables do in such a way that it goes up. But if, the, if you use saturation deficit, then as the, with relative humidity being constant, if you do the algebra for literally one line of algebra, you can convince yourself that the saturation deficit goes up. So if it's always 80% humidity, the difference between the actual humidity and the saturation will increase. And that larger difference is bad for cyclones. So they, the number goes down. And we don't know which one of these is right. Um, there's some theory about it, but not very well developed and not very convincing. And the past data doesn't tell you because there isn't an analog to the global warming signal. Um, the whole planet warming up is very different than the regional variations or even interannual variations that are there in today's climate that you can train on. And this is our peculiar semi-statistical model, but we think this is still the state of the science because um, if you take the highest resolution global models that actually predict do hurricanes pretty well, um, and then you put more CO2 in those, some go up and some go down for those two. So the, the basic conclusion remains, this is the state of the art, even though our model you know, is not the fanciest. Um, so I bring this up only to say, I mean, when Jane came up with this result, she said, I can't publish this. This is a disaster. We don't, and I said, no, you have to publish it because this is what it is. You know? And I, the, I guess the, we call this an, um, I'm not sure if I'm using the word right for the philosophers, but epistemic or a deep uncertainty is a thing you don't know how to put a number on it. I can't tell you the probability that this one is right versus this one is right. I mean, you can try to compare back here and see which one agrees better, but it doesn't, you don't learn much from that. So um, when you, I bring this up because when you start working with users, and the user we've been working with most is the insurance industry, but a few others, people who really want to make a decision based on your data, what I've learned is that, I don't know if it's, I find that we spend more time talking about this kind of stuff, the stuff we don't know, than when we're writing papers for our peers. Because when you're writing papers for your peers, the problems that are too hard to solve, you just don't solve them. And you advance the science in whatever direction you can, and you get through peer review and your career goes on. But when somebody's going to actually use the data for something, if you don't tell them about all those hairy problems that you don't know how to solve, you're kind of being dishonest and you're not telling them the things they need to know. So I'd just like to bring this up to say that I think in climate risk science, one of the things that distinguishes it from the science I was trained to do is the need to confront the stuff that we can't solve in some way and characterize these uncertainties, even if it's 
we can't do it in the way that we'd like because we, we don't, there's no multi-model ensemble that will give you meaning pro meaningful probabilities of this. Okay, um, and, and, uh, and I, maybe I should have said, we wrote a little review paper. I think the her, tropical cyclone frequency is a big science problem, like will there be more her, or fewer hurricanes in the future? We know hurricanes are getting stronger and producing more rain, but we don't know if the numbers should increase or decrease. So that, that's just a big problem. There's people doing interesting things, and we wrote a little review, but I don't want to talk about that anymore. Um, this is just to give a flavor of uh, some of our insurance work, and then I'm going to probably not talk about it anymore, but this is, was sponsored by a company called Aon, which is a reinsurance brokerage firm. So we worked with them. So they have their own cap modeling group called Impact Forecasting. And so we took our model, generate storms from CMIP6, um, a bunch of different scenarios. This is 2, 4.5. This is 3, 7.0, so more global warming here than here. And then we generate storms and we predict the change in you know, um, land following rates at different coastal gate sections of the US coast at different intensities. And then they take that and generate wind footprints and they, and they take those differences by category at each place and put them into their model with their exposure and vulnerability, which we don't have access to. And they generate changes in loss for 2070, this is, we've done it for different periods, going into the future. So how much will their hurricane losses change compared to the baseline historical. And you, you see there's two branches. That's because of the two models I told you, that some go up and some go down. So we can't even tell them the sign of the answer. Um, but, uh, but they're not huge changes. You know, these are like 10%-ish. So that, there's information there. I mean, it says as far as our model is concerned, US hurricane risk is not like a catastrophic, you know, we're not going to be on a different planet in a few decades if this is right. So it's not that big of an, I mean, they have bigger problems from inflation and stuff maybe. I mean, there's some other interesting things about it. Um, one is that this, this is definitely a global warming signal. We've averaged over tons of stuff, so, so all the internal variability should be averaged out of this. So if it's a response to global warming, and this one has more global warming than that one, then why is the increase less in this than that? There's some nonlinearity here or something, and actually we think there's two possible reasons for this. One is that 37.0 has a lot of aerosol forcing on top of the greenhouse gas forcing, and aerosols and greenhouse gases affect hurricanes differently. So even though in watt per meter squared, the number of watts per meter squared is all you need to know to tell you the temperature change. The net radius forcing is what you need for temperature. But for hurricanes, it's not that simple, and forcings in the short wave and long wave behave differently, and that's because of the theory of potential intensity. Um, so we, that's one possible reason. The other possible reason I'm going to talk about it in a minute. It has to do with the tropical Pacific. Um, so now let's do that. Um, the other theme I want to bring up here is that I have found that doing applied work like this gives us ideas for basic research. Because people ask you, can you solve this problem? And you say, no. But maybe we could do this other thing that would get us halfway there. And, you, and then we've sometimes written proposals to you know, NSF or whoever and, and, and had good um, success out of that. So this is one of those examples where we started worrying about the, and it's still in the category of like hard problems that we don't quite know how to solve, but we're trying to do things. Okay, so here's what it is. And um, this is not a problem that we discovered. It's a problem that we are, have recognized the importance of. So, um, okay, so what are we looking at here? This is the tropical Pacific, and the top panel is the trend in sea surface temperature averaged over a big multi set of models, I think just about all of them in, in, that had the CMIP6. Going into the future, oh gosh, what scenario was it? Um, I think this is 2, 4.5. It doesn't say on the slide, but some CMIP scenario from 21 to, tw tw to 2050. We like using the early part of the short, shorter time periods, because for adaptation, that's what people, nobody's thinking about adapting to, in 2100. So anyway, but it would look the same to 2100, just with bigger numbers. So the trend in the Pacific that the models predict is that it's warming everywhere, of course, but it's warming the most here. Oh, I'm supposed to use this. Wait. It's warming the most. I don't seem to be very, OK. It's warming the most here in the cold tongue region. So in other words, the trend looks like an El Nino event. El Nino events are interannual, and this is a long-term trend, but the structure is vaguely similar. And if you then take this, these same models and downscale with our model to produce tropical cyclones, 
And you pick the one where the overall number goes up. Pick this just to get the worst, you know, we, we tend to focus on the worst one because if we're thinking about risk, that's sort of natural. So here's the, the scenario where hurricanes increase globally. You see that the increase is big in the Pacific, West Pacific and Eastern Pacific, and decreases in the Atlantic and also in some parts of the Southern Hemisphere. This is track density. So this is the number of hurricanes passing through, or tropical cyclones, <laughs> passing through each box. And, how that, and the trend in that in time. So this kind of makes sense. If you've ever looked at hurricanes in El Nino, um, or if you haven't, I'll just tell you that this is vaguely looks like what you'd expect in an El Nino event in the sense the Pacific gets more active and the Atlantic is suppressed. So if you have a trend that looks like that, I mean, the exact pattern is not quite the same as what a typical El Nino event would look like, but it's of that sense. And so we showed this to our, the story here is we showed this to our um, colleagues at Aon and they said, huh, this is interesting, because the last 40, 50 years have not looked like this. I mean, it's been warming, right? But there have actually been, the West Pacific has actually been quiet, and the Atlantic has been ramping up like gangbusters. So why is that? And we said, hmm, that's a good question. And then we realized that our colleagues down the hall, Richard Seeger and Mark Kane and Amy Clement, who's at Miami now but got her start at Lamont, had done a lot of work on this. And then we started working with them to understand what was going on. And basically, um, the, um, they've been making the case since Amy's thesis in 1996 or so, or at least the paper came out in 1996, um, that uh, you would not expect an El Nino-like response to re uh, global warming, at least in the short term, that you would expect a La Nina-like response. And at the time they published that paper, that had been happening for a couple decades, but people didn't believe that it was the real answer. They thought it was just internal variability. But now there's more data and um, more arguments explaining why the models might be wrong, and it's becoming harder to ignore it. So here's the trend over the last. So this is now, his, that was future projection. This is history, but I'll bring them together in another slide. But this is the trend over the last 40 years in sea surface temperature. This is one data set that had SST. There's some disagreement between data sets. But, um, and it shows the opposite, right? It doesn't look, the trend does not look like El Nino. It looks like La Nina. It's, it's cooling uh, here, even in absolute terms. Um, so it has the opposite structure. And so if we downscale, if we look at the observations of track density trends over that period, they look like the opposite of what we got from downscaling the models. Maybe not surprisingly, because the SST trend is also sort of the opposite. I mean, it's not exactly the opposite, but it has the opposite polarity. And um, so we said to the end people, like, well, maybe we're getting the, you know, our model of hurricane trends doesn't look, in the future, doesn't look like what's happened in the last 50 years or 40 years. What, I mean, you can get the same answer if you go back further in time than 81. It doesn't look like the recent history because the SST pattern doesn't look like the recent history in the models. The models think global warming should look like El Nino, and the observations so far say it looks like La Nina, even though there's a lot of internal variability and it's hard to see the trend. So, um, so you can say, well, this one was future, and this one is past. And you can also say, well, even 50, 40 years is not enough time to really characterize trends in the Pacific because it has huge internal variability. But if that were the case, you could look at the multi-model ensemble, and if the model, multi-model ensemble has the right internal variability, then at least some, this is multi-model means that I showed you a slide ago, but if you, if the models are right, then at least some ensemble members should look like what actually happened, because um, they should span the range of internal variability. And this is, if you ask that question, and here's what you get. So, and this is based on work done by Seeger and colleagues a couple of years before. What we're doing is it applying it to hurricanes, okay? But this is, so this is following on a figure that they made. Um, but this stuff is in a paper we uh, just put out in PNAS. But what's shown here is two measures of the state of the tropical Pacific. So this is the, a, a mem measure of the east-west temperature gradient on the equator, on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, the north-south um, gradient. So it's the north-south in sort of both directions. This, is, this one is, is close to traditional ENSO metrics. This one less so, but they both sort of characterize the, the, the pattern. And so an El Nino like pattern would be down here and a La Nina like pattern would be up here. And the observations are in the blue diamonds and there's five different data sets shown here and you can see that they are somewhat different. Um, and the HAD SST, which I just showed you, is the most extreme, but they're all in this quadrant. They all show a La Nina like trend. 
The models are scattered around um, with the multi-model mean being somewhat El Nino-like. But, and, and this is for the historical period now. If you, if you do it for the future period, the models shift more down to this quadrant. But so if, if the models were right and it was internal variability that explains the trend, if the models were right about the forced signal and thus the disagreement with observations is due to internal variability, then there should be some overlap between these two clouds of data. And there is a little bit. So you can still make that case that the models could be right, but I think it's getting difficult. All right, so, um, so just to summarize this, um, this is another one of these sort of deep uncertainty problems. The CMIP models show a force trend in SST that looks like El Nino in the sense that the gradient across, along the equator is getting weaker. But that disagree, the observations don't look like that. This, there has started in the last couple of years to be a lot of papers about this. Mostly, so it's called, the climate sensitivity people call it the sea surface temperature pattern effect. Because if, as the planet warms, if the pattern looks one way or the other, it changes the climate sensitivity. Basically, what the models are doing, warming up the cold tongue burns off low clouds and it makes the sense, climate sensitivity higher, whereas the observed pattern, if it was really the force signal, would imply a lower climate sensitivity because you'd have more low clouds. But our point is that the implications for impacts are maybe even bigger because the difference between an El Nino and La Nina for tropical cyclones is enormous. The global num difference might not be that much, but it changes everywhere the regional pattern. So an El Nino suppresses hurricanes in the Atlantic, a La Nina does the opposite, and for all the other places, pretty much all the basins in the world similarly too, and the El and so also affects floods, droughts, and, and heat, and lots of other hazards, severe convection. So the, tr the trends may not be perfect analogs to the interannual events, but nonetheless, this suggests that we can't, if the, if this is, if the models are really this wrong, then we can't use the multi-model ensemble to characterize the uncertainty because the reality could be outside of the whole ensemble. So what do you do then? You can use a storyline approach, and here's the um, most highly cited paper about that, um, among many, led by Ted Shepard. The storyline is basically saying you can't put a probability on it, but you could say what could the future look like if all the models were wrong? So we have a couple projects now where we're working on this and basically trying to make future scenarios, just force some models to do things in the future that look more like an extrapolation of the recent historical trends that, that, that have SSD pattern of the opposite of, the, um, of what the current CMIP models do. And then think about the implications of that for extreme weather. All right. Um, so I've been talking about hazard, and it's complicated and tricky for all the reasons we know, resolution and sample size and model biases, but I want to talk a little bit about vulnerability and exposure now, which in some ways may be even harder, because these are more empirical things, and they're, and they're highly data constrained. And Anyway, it's certainly harder for us, because we weren't trained in it, and only in our recent work have we been trying to do this. So I, I feel not really an expert, but I'm going to tell you a little of what we've been doing to try to give a sense of, of what I think some of the um, issues and challenges are. So um, what is vulnerability? Just as briefly as a nod to the social scientists, you could, there's an enormous literature on climate vulnerability, which is much richer and more sophisticated, and they talk about lots of different things, some of which is, some of it is qualitative. But in insurance, you boil it down to a curve, or a lot of curves, uh, a, a, a set of curves. But basically, a vulnerability curve is something that tells you, if here is the, uh, oops, on the x-axis, you have some measure of the hazard. So here it's wind speed. And on the y-axis, you have what fraction of your value is destroyed at that wind speed. So at low wind speeds, nothing happens. Your buildings are fine. At high wind speeds, they're going to be totally destroyed. It goes to 1 because it's a fraction of the value. The exposure tells you what the value is. This is the vulnerability. And then you have a curve in between that rises up. And almost all vulnerability, vulnerability curves that are reasonable look something qualitatively like this, right? At low hazard, nothing happens. At bad enough hazard, your thing is destroyed. And in between, there's an increase. And this is a particular functional form that Carrie Emanuel made up, um, but it has some free parameters. One is at what value does it start to pick up, and the other is how fast does it pick up at that value. And so we're going to use this, not having better data for the next thing I'm going to show you, we used this form but tuned those parameters to the, um, to the uh, as calibration, to tune them to the observations. So. Um, just one slide, one super complicated slide that I don't want you to read, 
I just want you to note that it is complicated. And this is uh, from a paper by a guy named Peter Vickery, who's a wind engineer who did a lot of the pioneer work on vulnerability, uh, uh, wind vulnerability. And it's basically what you would do if you had all the data you could possibly want. You had a building, you know what it's made out of and what its shape is, and you put it in a high resolution co uh, computational fluid dynamics model, and you measure the stresses and pressures on it, and you figure out when the roof is going to blow off because the you know, nails don't hold it in or whatever. I'm making this up, but the complicated flow chart of what's going to happen, you know, if you really knew everything. You can never, you can't do, I mean, some people in insurance can do this, but in general, if you want to do this globally for climate adaptation, you know, in the global south, with public data, you, you, this is impossible. So instead, we're going to do something much simpler. Um, this is a, the exposure we use um, for the thing I'm about to show you comes from a data set developed by David Bresch's group at ETH. David Bresch is a guy who used to be in the insurance industry and then went back to ac academia. So this is, um, they use gross domestic product country by country and then downscale it to a fine grid using night light from space. I'm told there's a little more fancier things you can do now with the high, newest high resolution satellites and you guys might know better than me, but as of a few years ago, this was state of the art and so it's what we use. So it's GDP and night light to get exposure, um, basically economic value assumed to be in built the built environment at some resolution, one kilometer resolution, actually. And then um, Emmanuel's uh, vulnerability. So this was work done by Jane Baldwin, who was a postdoc with our group now. She's a faculty member at UC Irvine, not far away, if you want to talk to her, although she's on leave right now. But um, hazard, a bunch of cyclone tracks. This is a study about the Philippines. When we do this kind of applied work, we get more tend to get more country specific. And I started writing papers with like, geopolitical place names and like names of cities and countries, which I didn't have when I was younger. Anyway, uh, Philippines, so some typhoon tracks. We can get them from our model. In this case, they were from the observations from IB tracks. And then we have an empirical wind model that gives us a wind, oops, uh, empirical wind model that gives us a wind swath for each storm across the islands. And then um, a vulnerability curve that's it's shown as two vulnerability curves here. So this is a manuals form with two different values of the parameters. And I'll say in a minute why there was two of them. Um, but we got these parameters by calibration. And there's two different calibrations here. And then the exposure is the night light from space thing that I just showed you. So given that, you take the historical storms, you take the vulnerability, you calculate a lot of losses. You compare that to the observed losses, which is from a database called EMDAT, which is um, and this is with the World Bank. An economist named Brian Walls from the World Bank helped us with this, and that was really uh, important and necessary for us to have confidence that we knew what we were doing. And um, oops. Uh, and we get the, the model the losses, take the observed losses, see how well they agree, and then tune the parameters to get the best agreement we can. Um, and then you can use that going forward for future scenarios by keeping those things the same or, or changing them and if you think you can predict the change of of buildings, but um, so what this is, and that's uh, Jane, um, and this is now published. This is the color map on the Philippines is the measure of agreement between model and observations. So um, blue is we predict less damage than observations, and red is we predict more. From and we did a few different statistical me measures. This is one called total damage ratio that emphasizes the biggest events, but. When we used one vulnerability curve for the whole country, um, we got too much loss in Luzon, which is where Manila is. Manila is right here compared to the rest of the Philippines. And so we got much better results. We want to have a parsimonious model, right? You don't want to overfit. But we found that we could get a lot better results with two vulnerability curves, one for Manila and another for everywhere else. And the World Bank has household surveys that actually tell you something about the buildings in each region, and that tells us that indeed in Manila the buildings are, it's the richest part of the country, the buildings are heavier and sturdier, and so you should use different vulnerability curve for there. My point here is not that this is any huge breakthrough, but just that this is the kind of games you play when you have, don't have all the data you want. Um, we don't really know what all the buildings are. are. We only have very piecemeal um, data. But this was our first model, first attempt to do actual losses as opposed to just hazard. OK. Um, just to, so that's one thing. Um, I showed you the complicated slide about vulnerability, and then I showed you what we did. Just to take it to a totally different place, if you've heard of integrated assessment models, these are the models that are used to price the social cost of carbon. 
The, the early one, one of the early ones is called DICE, developed by Bill Nordhaus, who got a Nobel Prize for it, and um, famously predicted that the losses from climate change wouldn't be too bad. But let's not get into that part of it. This is just, to, I would just want to talk about the degree of simplicity. So I would argue that DICE is still a climate risk model. It has a hazard, which is just the global mean temperature as a function of time, one number per year or whatever. Um, it has an exposure that's just the global economy, and it has, you know, one number, and it has a damage function that's a simple polynomial, you know, quadratic thing with a couple of coefficients. So they now, and there is now much more fancy integrated assessment models, but these are models that are used to measure the economic impact of climate change. So I just want to say it's still a climate risk model, but compare the degrees of complexity, right? One bunch of single numbers, the whole economy versus like individual buildings in a CFD. This very, very diverse kind of scales and levels of, of uh, complexity. Um, this is just one slide to say there's now much more sophisticated integrated assessment models. The EPA has adopted a couple of them. Um, DSIM is from the, so, uh, the Climate Impacts Lab, which is a group of people at Ruck, uh, Bob Kopp at Rutgers and Saul Shung at Berkeley and other people at Chicago and elsewhere that spent you know, a decade or something developing this. And it has, it's much more complicated. It has much more granularity. It uses climate models in more sophisticated ways. It uses econometrics to get the vulnerability. So if, for in most cases, but they have different economic sectors. And there's a coastal flood one that actually looks like a cat model. It has synthetic storms, so it's kind of a hybrid. And this is another, GIV is from another group who I don't know, but these are two different models. And they both now, the social cost of carbon that the US uses used to be like $40, $50. Now the EPA is using like 200. And it's interesting that these two models agree on that, but totally disagree on how it's broken down by sector. So one model says that agriculture is half the answer, and the other says that it's almost none of the answer. So don't, so, so this agreement, the bottom line agreement belies the uncertainty, um, just to say that this is another application of this kind of work with a different, the social cost of carbon is used to, is really used to a uh, number that the federal government uses to think about the climate impacts. It's really a mitigation oriented measure in some way because um, it's thinking about, you know, it's giving an incentive to burn less carbon um, as opposed to everything else I'm talking about, which is about, in some sense, about adaptation. Okay, um, so to summarize what I've said, I'm not quite at the end yet, but we're getting close. Um, to summarize, the hazard can be anything from a global mean surface temperature to a single storm. The space and time resolution I've showed you very hugely, as does the time frame, the type of decision we're informing, what's empirical versus what's physical. The exposure can be assets at a micro scale or the whole economy. Vulnerability can come from knowing a lot or knowing almost nothing and making it up. Some uncertainties are very deep and you can't put numbers on them, deeper epistemic. A lot is proprietary, so I, I, our stuff is, is open source, but a lot of this work is being done in the private sector for private sector clients, and you can't find out how they're doing things. And the, the last couple of remarks I want to make, which is sort of the, my point of this whole thing, there's a lot of people doing a lot of work of this kind in the world now, and a lot of it is good, and they're very smart, and they're doing whatever they have to do, but it's applied work. Usually there's some customer who's paying for it, whether it's a government or a private sector. And people are doing whatever they need to do to get an answer. But there's not a lot of systematic comparison, certainly not in the private sector. But if you think of what we do, like model, like model into comparison projects, you know, um, or, or I, I'm going to be out of my depth if I talk about satellite missions. But I know if you have a satellite and some other country has a satellite measuring the same thing, you're going to compare them, right? But that's not happening in this field. People are doing whatever they need to do, and there's not a lot of like, oh, you did it this way and we did it this way, and how much difference does it make, and what are the consequences of that? That's what I think we need to have now, um, because the consequences, the, the, the ramifications, the use of this stuff is becoming so much bigger. So um, this is a pitch I've made to my colleagues in a couple, uh, a, a bunch of different places now. In climate science, I was taught that we understand the system through a hierarchy of models. This is, comes from a great paper by Isaac Held. And this is a figure from a, a, a paper in EOS following this by um, uh, my colleague Lorenzo Polvani. Basically, in climate, you know, we only have one Earth. We can't do experiments on it. So that's in the laboratory science, sciences, they do controlled experiments. We don't have that. We only have models. And we don't know whether to believe the models. But at least if you have the complicated model that you use for prediction, you don't really understand it. But then you make a simpler one that you understand better. 
and a simpler one, and a simpler one, and we build up understanding by understanding what the different levels of complexity buy us in terms of predictive skill and uncertainty and so on. So this is you know, the real Earth versus a GCM versus an aqua planet versus a dry dynamical core, and each one of those tells you different things. Um, and that's, uh, that's how I was taught to s think about studying the Earth system in terms of learning what causes, what causes and effects are. And this is a great paper that I would urge anybody to read after Manabe. Um, Tsuki Manabe won the Nobel Prize. His uh, colleagues at GFDL, Nader Jivanji and Isaac Held and Ramaswamy wrote a paper explaining why basically Manabe deserved the Nobel Prize and how basically it was for papers he wrote in the 60s with a single column model. So single column model is very simple, right? One dimensional. And um, from that, Manabe got things we take for granted, the forcing feedback framework, the fact that the stratosphere cools when the troposphere warms in terms of response to CO2. What even the value of the climate sensitivity, Manabe got something around 3K. And they're saying he knew model elegance. He, Manabe had been playing with models, and he knew from having a hierarchy what he needed, the simplest model he could get to explain behavior. And this is what we don't have in climate risk, I think, because we're just trying to get the answer. Uh, and so as one more piece of historical context, when we think about the climate sensitivity, the fact that we still have a range that hasn't budged much in 40 years since the Charney report, that the uncertainty is not much smaller than it was then, is often cited as a failure. Why can't we narrow that? But I think, first of all, I think in this era of climate risk science and trying to take action on an urgent problem, we have to stop saying all the time that our research is going to narrow the uncertainties. I mean, we can keep trying to do that, but if we need to give answers to people today, we have to just characterize the uncertainties that we have in the most decision-relevant way. And in that context, I think we might look at back at what the Charney Report and Manabe's early work and others didn't say. Maybe those guys knew what they were doing. Maybe they knew how to characterize the uncertainty right, and that's why it hasn't budged in some sense. So I think we know, but in any way, I think we know what we know and what we don't, in part because of a hierarchy of models. And so um, I'm almost at the end, I swear. Think about the reanalyses or the CMIP archive. If you want to know the current state of the climate or the state over the last you know, few decades, use the reanalyses. If you want to know the future projections, you go to the CMIP archive. Both thing is, things are public. They're widely vetted with tons of papers about them. It's not that they're perfect, but the research will tell you what's good and what's bad, and you can read all about it. And you know that's basically the default state of the art. For some purposes, you might need something better, and you might do something else. But that's, there's a, a certain community support of these products. And we don't have that. We don't have that in the space of climate risk. We don't have any public analog for hazard and risk data. There's a lot of stuff. But there's no consensus and intercomparison and hierarchy and, and all that that we know in climate science. Last thing I want to say, um, and this is just to, uh, this is partly to plug my podcast, which um, Joao mentioned, but also to say I, I should give another talk about this, but I won't, not only because I don't have time, but I don't have the expertise and knowledge either, but just to say that to do usable science right, you have to be working with a user. You have to actually engage with somebody who wants the information. And for us, it's been a little bit NGOs, but mostly insurance industry, and they're kind of special user because they're kind of relatively rich and knowledgeable. But this is my a guy who I, uh, I wasn't his research advisor, but he's a PhD at Columbia, and I was on his committee, Usman Daye, and, and he uh, on the right. And he went back and is now the head of the Weather Service in Senegal. So we're proud of our graduates. And he, he worked at the IRI at Columbia, which is a, a, a unit within the university that did a lot of climate application work and, and helping people in different countries use science. So he learned how to work with users. And when he went back to Senegal, he had these workshops with farmers where he went out to the countryside with social scientists and talked to farmers and tried to understand what are, they, what are their problems, what are their needs, how can they develop forecast products that, that will be actually used. This is from an article that was written about, uh, done about him at NPR where he's holding one of the farmer's babies. And the, and the quote is, um, only God is 100%. He's explaining to the farmers in, a, in a, one of these meetings, like, OK, you know, sometimes the forecasts are going to be wrong, and we don't want you guys to stop using them because, you know, it's, it's their probabilities. And you, he's trying to teach the farmers about probabilities. And the old man in the back raises his hand and says, don't worry about it. We know. Only God is right 100%. We understand. So anyway, that's the cute quote. But it's just to say, I can't do justice to it, but I think to do this work right, you have to be engaged with the user. Otherwise, you're just imagining what somebody's going to want, and you're not going to be right. Um, so this is really the end. I think we need a synthetic climate science risk that takes the kind of thing we know how to do in climate science, but takes it to this applied level with actual quantitative stuff, quantitative uh, and decision-oriented with actual hazards and risks.
And I think to do that, it has to have a theoretical, even though it might seem like an oxymoron, but this is a very applied science, but I think it needs a theoretical side where we understand what we know and don't know and why and how we can say that. So that means, and I think, I spend a lot of time at Epis, big uncertainties because I think when you start talking to real users, at least for me, that has been something I have um, come to feel is that we have to talk about the stuff we don't know more than maybe we do when we're just writing peer-reviewed papers. I didn't do justice to it, but I think it has to be user-driven and ethical. And I, I'm not an expert on ethics, but we're starting to organize some workshops on climate ethics to think about that. I think if we're putting our data out there, it's possible for it to do harm sometimes. You know, having, having it be used is not always good. Like, used for what, by whom? I think we have to start thinking about that. And I guess the reason I'm here and giving a bunch of talks like this in you know, academic and government labs is that I think for, for us to really serve society right, this stuff should live in our spaces. We can't leave it to the private sector because they don't have the right set of incentives to solve the public problems, which are, you know, there's going to be big painful decisions around climate adaptation, and those should be supported by science that has understanding behind it, generated by the kind of community process that's familiar to us from basic climate science. Okay, so that's all I have. I won't read this again, but it's just acknowledging a lot of people whose names I, some of whom I said and some of whom I didn't, and that's all. I'm sorry I ran too long, but thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Adam. It's a wonderful presentation. We have time for a couple of questions or a few questions if people want to say wrong. Jessica, um, I'll ask you if you have a question. Go to the mic. Thank you. Is it on? Is it on? Okay. Um, really nice talk. That was great. Um, so I'm curious what your experience has been working with these insurance industries when you're trying to communicate these epistemic risks because mm -hmm. We have enough of a hard time communicating regular uncertainties, like uncertainties on satellite measurements and, and you know, uncertainties that are, to us, very simple uncertainties. Um, and, and yet, when you go to work with an end user, that becomes a real sticking point. And so I guess I'm, I'm curious about what you've run into when it comes to these deeper risks that are, um, you know, in some ways, run the risk of undermining the climate science message, um, but are real. Yeah. Um, I'm curious to know which end users you work with, because I think there's different flavors of end users. But the insurance industry, again, remember, is kind of a special end user, because they're very well educated. They have, I mean, our, the, 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 our sponsors, the teams, that it's like they're kind of paying us to collaborate with them, because they have their own PhD scientists that came out of our institutions. So these are people that are pretty easy to talk to. I mean, if they've been in the industry a long time, they kind of go off and do a different thing, and they become real experts on certain things, and they're not always experts on. A lot of them are really good at knowing how to do probabilities of looking at hurricane data, but not as good at climate. But they, uncertainty is their business, right? So they, they are, they're used to uncertainty. They, would, they literally would have no business if it wasn't for uncertainty. So they're really good at talking about it. They would rather put numbers on it. And so when we showed them those two branches of the hurricane thing, they were like, OK, so what's the probability of each one? And we were like, Ugh. You know, we ended up writing a paper about that, which says it's like 55, 45, or something. But we, but we don't really, I mean, that's not a strong basis for that statement. It's, um, so they definitely press us for, um, to see how much we can, they can get out of us. But I think really, um, in our experience, certainly, first of all, nobody has ever pressured us to change the answer. Um, they've sometimes pressured us to simplify it, but never to change. Nobody's trying to get, you know, it's not like they're the fossil fuel industry trying to get us to say that climate change isn't as bad or something like that. I haven't had, got any of that from anyone. Um, they, uh, I think at the end of the day, the, my experience has been that they genuinely want to know the science. One of our one of the people at, at, at Aon said to me, Adam, we pay you all this money and you guys do all this research and you tell us not to believe any of it. I said, I love it. You guys are the best. <laughs> so I mean, I think they, but, but I don't know that they're typical of other, you, you, I think they're pretty special because they, they genuinely want to know the science, whatever it is. And if you tell them the science is a big uncertainty, that's not that unfamiliar a situation for them. I mean, because we're doing natural catastrophe, 
Like that, they might have the best. Mo they also model cyber, in, you know, cyber attacks and terrorism. I mean, you know, where do they? How do they make those models? What's the statistics on 9/11? Like, you know, so they're so they're not that. They're not in. They're not that shocked by it. But I'm not sure that that's representative of some other users. Thanks, Adam. That was a great talk. Part of my question has to do with something that we face out here in the Intermountain West is wildfires. So if you want to talk to a companies that don't understand risk, like the insurance companies, talk to the utility companies mm. because they are managing it and they're taking satellite data and they're putting risk models in and some of the work they're doing is like atrocious and it's getting rejected by agencies and state agencies and so mm. it's a fascinating problem that yeah. I think you might want to I know you're I mean I see your work it obviously is you know cyclones and hurricanes and that impact but it's it's also impacting our insurance rates and so it kind of fits into your larger thesis yeah. of, uh, of risk and what the colleague at University of Maryland's calling uh, 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 climate finance, right? Have you heard this term? Have you? It's kind of a buzzing term that's coming around and I was curious what your thoughts were, but yeah, I mean, dig in on the insurance, uh, I mean, on uh, on utility companies and Pacific Corp, which is owned by Berkshire Hathaway and PG&E and SoCal Edison, they don't understand risk like, like Aon or any of these large insurance companies. But yeah, what's your thoughts on climate finance? Because it's kind of a growing buzz term. Uh, you were, so there was fire in there and climate finance. Those yeah. are sort of two different, yeah. you know, try to talk about both of them. Yeah. Fire, yes, I'm not an expert, but I have been in a lot of rooms where it comes up, um, including insurance meetings. And a couple things to say is one, a few years ago, the insurance industry was not particularly worried about wildfire. It wasn't a big loss for them. I mean, hurricane is the biggest one, US hurricane. Japan earthquake is second. Uh, actually, severe convective storm is a pretty big one, not because they have single big huge events, but lots of steady losses. But wildfire was not a big one. It's still not at the top of the list, but as you know, it was like uh, it went from not being off the radar to being on the radar in a big way because everybody's like, what is happening? You know, it, it, it was, I don't need to tell you, right? And, and so the model, there's a lot of effort being put now into making better models than they had. Um, the part of the reason the insurers are pulling out of California is that the government won't let them use catastrophe models. They're only allowed to use historical um, data to model fire risk, but the historical data obviously is kind of out of date now. Um, so those are some things with the insurance industry. The power companies I don't know as much about. I don't know what they're doing. I'm, um, inter I don't know. You wouldn't. You know more than I do, obviously, about what kind of how they're thinking about their risk. But they have to be aware that whatever they thought ten years ago is irrelevant now. Um, the climate finance means a lot of things, but I mean broadly, I think when people say that, you, sometimes climate finance means you know things things like loss and damage that are in national negotiations. But usually I think that word is used by people who are thinking about private money. And um, as with everything else, there's sort of adaptation and mitigation. So a lot of climate finance is, you know, carbon sequestration companies and, you know, offsets, although that's now, I think, properly become uh, kind of out. But, um, so, but some is adaptation. I mean, there's private, so there's private money that wants to go to climate. The governments aren't putting enough in and people say, oh, we can get private to make up the gap. You know, it's tricky because the incentives, some is philanthropic, but a lot of times people actually want to make money. And so there's, as of course, a tension between making money and doing good. But I do think that to the extent, one thing I can say is that to the extent that there's private money going into climate for whatever reason, but has at least part of its objective making a positive difference in the world, if some of that is going to adaptation and not all to mitigation, then it needs this kind of science because who's going to want to invest money to solve a problem unless you can define the problem with some kind of data? I mean, there may be lots of other considerations, but there should be some data in it and it has to have some climate change component. You know, if there's a huge hurricane, you know, someplace, was that climate change or was that not climate change? You have to have some position on that if you're spending money to mitigate the next one and, and you, 
are calling it climate finance, right? You have to say what the, the disasters have to do with the climate and is, how is the risk changing. So I do think there's a need for some kind of science and I think it's, it's pretty wild west right now because um, it's these private providers that are providing it and, and even adaptation metrics are totally inconsistent. There's no, the nice thing about mitigation is a ton of carbon is a ton of carbon is a ton of carbon, but adaptation, there's no, adaptation is anything, you know, some is agriculture, some is health, some is building, some is seawalls and infrastructure, some is, and like, how do you compare those things? You can try to put them in dollars, like, you know, but there isn't a, there isn't a uniform way of sort of pricing adaptation. And your, kind of your closing statement, sorry, because you just talked yourself out of your closing statement, which said, or one of them, which was the academia and government labs should be doing the risk analysis. I don't disagree that we're not qualified, but you know, a quarter of all venture capital in the last year went into climate tech, right? We have yeah. climate tech 2.0 going on. There are startups all the time that are going into this. We, yeah. we and it's an important. Well, I mean, so component. I'll say, so, yeah, yeah, right. So, you know, you just talk yourself out of that closing remark. And I no, I mean, I don't think so because I, I'm not saying the private sector shouldn't do it. Right. The private sector should should do what it's doing and maybe do it better, and that's fine because there is a private need. There are companies that are want to spend money on climate one way or another. They need some data to support it. The private sector is the right person to provide that. Right? Because they're going to serve the needs of those customers in a way that you and I can't do from the, our institutions. But the problems are, first of all, the public needs it too. Like the biggest holder of climate risk in the U United States is the U.S. government. And there, sooner or later, there's going to be painful decisions. Should we, taxpayer in Ohio, be paying for people to live in coastal Florida or not? And how much? And if those decisions are made on black box data, it's not good politically. That's one thing. But even the private sector, nobody knows that this stuff is any good or not. I mean, you can talk, of course, you can go visit the company and talk to the scientists and you can probably figure out something about how good it is, but not in general that, you know, they're not publishing, they're not doing intercomparisons. comparisons. If we had some public stuff, first of all, they would take it, the free stuff and build on it the same way that they use NASA and NOAA data and, every, and CMIP and everything else. And they would still have a business because the, you know, banks are still going to pay that and the insurers are still going to pay private companies to do the work. And plus, you'd be better able to evaluate it because at least there would be some analog out in the world that's getting peer reviewed that could serve as a reference point for the private stuff, you know, and a sort of baseline. You know, right now, think of weather. I think weather's a good analog. NOAA has the weather service, they, they have EMC, they run the models, they put out a forecast. So everybody has a forecast that's a public good. Great. The private sector, there's a tons of companies doing it, right? They're making their own models, they're doing AI, they're putting it on apps, they're doing all kinds of stuff, and they're doing great, right? But they're not, there's no conflict there. There's different roles and there's a certain complementarity. And right now in climate, I think we have just an underdeveloped public sector situation in this applied space of climate risk. Basic climate science all comes from government and academia. All the private sector stuff is built on top of it. They wouldn't exist without it. They're not going to run CMIP and launch satellites and all of that. But this other layer lives mainly in the private sector. Or to the extent that it lives in academic institutions, it's in a piecemeal way that lacks the organization and kind of community that we have in basic science. Science question, actually. So let's switch gears. Um, what's so special about the South Atlantic Ocean that ah. tropical cyclones don't really like it? Yeah, it's cold. And um, did I have a map of the whole SST field? Uh, Is it just SST or? It's it, there's wind shear too, but they kind of go together. Um, both the South Atlantic and the Southeast Pacific. Did I have an SST map? No, those are SST trends. I don't have the total SST field. But it's the South Atlantic and the South East Pacific are both too cold and there's high wind shear too. And I can't, off the top of my head, partition it between SST and wind, but, but they're, they're unfavorable. It, it's, um, I would say that is, a, even though I'm not giving you a very precise answer about the relative roles of, of wind shear and SST, but I think if you take the typical I think we understand this about as well as we understand any other feature of the tropical cyclone climatology in the sense that if you take the measures of genesis that we have, um, we don't have a theory for genesis. That's why I was saying um, uh, in this slide, uh, I should have said that. We don't know why this number is the number per year and not like that number or that number, which is why it's so hard to predict these little changes. 
But we do understand something about the geographic patterns and what variables influence those. And you know, we understand like the ENSO patterns because when the SST goes up here and the wind shear, the jet moves and the wind shear shifts, like we kind of can see why the Atlantic gets suppressed and the Pacific gets enhanced. And those same factors are consistent with no hurricanes in the Atlantic. Almost none. I mean, as there has been one or two, as you probably know, weak ones over the last decade or two. But yeah, I think that is a more or less understood. Great. Even if Thank not you. precisely. Thank you, Adam. Evan, you had a question? On the WebEx? It's in the chat. So you, you want to repeat it? 